About a year ago, my wife Anna and I were at a mechanic shop servicing our car about 30 minutes south of here. And as I went to pay, the mechanic said, oh, you're that conservative leader. You know, Brian Mulroney is a family friend of mine. And I said, oh, really? How do you know Brian Mulroney? And he said, well, my dad was a miner at the Iron Ore Company. And when Brian was the president, he used to spend a lot of time with the guys on the ground and ask their opinions, hear their stories, and most of all, get tips on how they could be running a better business. This was the kind of down-to-earth spirit that he brought, but more importantly than that spirit and collegiality with the workers on the ground was his incredible memory. You see, when that miner passed away, decades later, Brian called the family. And what is so incredible about that phone call is that in the interim period, Brian Mulroney fought two leadership races, won two majority governments, shook hands and spent time with presidents, kings, queens, and other prime ministers, negotiated free trade deals, watched the end of the Cold War, sent our troops into the Persian Gulf, and with all that passing through his mind, he still remembered the miner from the Iron Ore Company. That is kindly, kindness. That is humility. And you know where I think it came from? I think in that miner, he saw his dad, an electrician from a working class small town in Quebec, d'une ville travaillant au Québec, Bécomo. A modest Irish working class upbringing taught him the value of work, family, neighborhood, loyalty, and merit. For me, this part of his legacy is personal. I was born to a teenage mother, incidentally, from a, she was from a working class Irish family. She put me up for adoption to two school teachers. And I was just becoming aware that there was such a thing as Prime Minister when he had that job. And like millions of young people from similar backgrounds, we looked to him and said, if the Irish son of a working class electrician from a mill town can rise to become Prime Minister, then in this country, anyone from anywhere can do anything. <laughs> he took his journey from a small town to big business, leading some of the great enterprises of Canada, many of these jobs he had in his late 30s and early 40s. His shot, first shot at politics came with a setback, but he would brush aside that setback with a second run for leadership, which he would win before he could take on the mighty liberal machine in the forthcoming 1984 election. Before he could do that, he had to come to this place. Uh, and on his first day in the House, he squared off with the legendary Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who teased him about parachuting from his corporate office in Montreal into a by-election win in rural Nova Scotia. If you'll allow me to quote the records, Mr. Speaker, the member from Central Nova has come a long way from that lob log cabin in Picto County. I see he's put away his rumpled trousers and odd sweaters to be brought out again in the next election. But in the meantime, Madam Speaker, it is nice for us in this change to be able to bask in the glow of the benign smile of a man who sent such shivers of pleasure down the spines of the matrons all the way from Oyster Pond to Mushaboom. <laughs> That's some good stuff. <laughs> then Mulroney had to rise and respond, and he said, I want you to know, Prime Minister, that during the summer, while you were otherwise occupied, there was a very pleasant summer for me. There was one untoward incident, and only one, the Liberal candidate in Central Nova persistently referred to a candidate from Quebec who didn't live in his riding and lived in a million-dollar house rent-free. And I want you to know, Prime Minister, I defended you vigorously. <laughs> uh, 
And when he appeared in this chamber with that big smile and confident tone, I think it was enough to make anybody take a walk in the snow. <laughs> soon after the election, uh, he would go on, soon, on, soon after he would win a record majority government. And he inherited a desperate, divided country, with skyrocketing debt having caused double-digit inflation, unemployment, and interest rates. Government had attacked industries and thousands of jobs. People's lives were falling apart. The country was more divided than ever before, with rocketing separatism and Western alienation. Yet he set out to do his work. He shrunk government, cut red tape, ended the appalling National Energy Program, privatized 23 money-losing state enterprises that went on to succeed and grow in the private sector, and to put any debate to rest, successive governments refused to renationalize any of them, proving that he was right. My personal favorite, he brought in the, he brought in the inf inflation control target, uh, which required the Bank of Canada to keep our money solid, ending uh, the prior decade of money printing inflation that had destroyed the working class. This policy, this inflation target came in in 1991 and would succeed in giving us price stability and sound money for two and a, and a half decades that followed. Finally, he stared down fear-mongering and falsehoods to defend and secure the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, the most successful trade agreement the modern world had ever seen with the most lucrative economy in the history of the planet. In fact, all of the trade access and more than we have today with the United States was secured in that agreement. All of the policies that he put forward, the, the ones I've named, all of them were controversial. Some were even unpopular, and yet none of them were, re were repealed by the subsequent Liberal government. He, in fact, started in 1984 after his election. A common-sense consensus of free markets, free trade, disciplined spending, sound money, strong defense, meritocracy and not aristocracy, a consensus that would endure for 30 years after his 1984 election and one that we should restore. He did away with Cold War neutrality and instead sided firmly and unequivocally with freedom and against communism. He led the world in the fight against apartheid. Nelson Mandela would later tell this House of Commons, and I will quote, I would also like to pay special tribute to the Prime Minister of this country, Brian Mulroney, who, is, who has continued along the path charted by Prime Minister Diefenbaker, who acted against apartheid because he knew that no person of conscience could stand aside as a crime against humanity was being committed. Prime Minister Mulroney, our people and organization respect and admire you as a true friend. We have been greatly strengthened by your involvement in the struggle against apartheid and the leadership that you have provided. He stood for the freedom at home as well. He stood on the side of turban-wearing Sikhs by allowing them to serve in the RCMP, where they keep us safe to this day. He was, br he was brilliant at talking through a microphone, but even better at talking through a telephone. In fact, for Brian Mulroney, phone calls were like an art form, using the, the, the telephone the way Michelangelo might have used a chisel or a brush. He would do it to make business deals, charm foreign leaders, and more importantly, to comfort grieving or suffering friends. I've lost count of the number of people who've told me about the worst day in their lives. They might have lost a loved one or a friend or suffered a terrible public humiliation. And then suddenly the phone would ring, and it would be that mellifluous baritone on the other end of the line. It's Brian Mulroney. He would console, joke, and maybe even throw in the odd curse about the unfairness of it all. And his friend's turmoil melted into the astonishment that one of the country's greatest prime ministers had offered love and laughter. I would call and seek his advice. In fact, I was very blessed to receive it. I asked him, for example, what is it that he did uh, to deal with all the strain of the job, the anticipation of a close election, the worry about the fate of a political battle? Uh, his answer was not that he studied Stoicism or mastered yoga or meditated on a hilltop, or even that he was a tough guy that had no worries in the world. No, he explained to me very simple. 
that he surmounted worry through one word, Mila, Mila Mulroney. His half-century-long love affair with, Mi with Mila uh, is one for the ages. They would have been married 52 years ju just in just a, few, a short time. He credited her with all his victories. She was his closest advisor, his rock. Only days before he died, he embraced her, and even with his failing eyes, as she recounted to me the other day, she looked her straight, he looked her straight in the face and said, you are so beautiful. They were inseparable from the moment they met until he took his last breath. He would tell me that my wife, Anida, who shared Mila's beautiful immigrant story, was my superpower. After my recent convention speech, he said, this, my speech was terrific, but Anna's was far, far better. <laughs> a little bit too loudly at that <laughs> Anna and I were happy to host the Mulroneys as our, their, our first guests at Stornoway after taking on these functions, and they, we were able to plunder their, both of their minds for incredible advice, but which I will not reveal here because I do not want any of my political competitors to take advantage of them. But my be the best and m most important advice was to stand with family. Brian and Mila's uh, achievements are greatest when it comes to their kids who tell stories even today that they could call Brian at any time and he would take the calls even when he was Prime Minister. Later they would find out that he had left world summits or cabinet meetings to talk with them. And that is why Mark, Caroline, Nicholas and Ben have been such smashing, smashing successes in their own right. And they are now parents themselves, 16 grandchildren. Go forth and multiply indeed. And so he lived out the words of Kipling, which I will summarize and paraphrase. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. Or watch the things you gave your life to, broken, and stoop down and build them up with worn-out tools, if you, if you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose your common touch. Yours is the earth and everything in it, and, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Rest in the peace of God, Prime Minister Mulroney. Thank you.